Well, this is late, but I always enjoy making these types of videos. And now that a lot of these movies are easier to find in 2023, I would like to give you our opinion on our favorite movies of the past year. There is no specific order, but the last one is the film I personally felt was the best of the year. I hope there are some selections here you'll finally feel nudged to check out for yourself. Now without any further ado, here are the best movies of 2022. Come on, Yang. One second. Don't forget to join us. I will. Imagine if Colin Farrell's character from The Lobster would have moved on and had a family in the world of her. That's the mood that After Yang makes me think of. Jake and Kira have an adopted daughter named Mika. When she was very little, they got an android named Yang to help raise her and teach her about her Chinese heritage. One day, Yang begins to malfunction, and so Jake looks into what he can do, either replacing the android or getting him fixed. As he goes through the complicated process, Jake begins to understand just how important Yang is and what some of his own shortcomings are. After Yang is a uniquely looking sci-fi film because even though it's set in the future where androids and clones exist, the technology that's present seems to come from sustainable sources. Yang is a robot, but he can decompose. None of the clothes that are worn have any plastic. The vehicle we see them riding is adorned with plants. There are lots of vibrant greens, especially in regards to the vegetation. It fits with the film's unhurried pace, where moments are allowed to just exist. And it leads to one of the film's themes, that of existence. Yang is an AI that has been around for some time. He's had experiences that have shaped and influenced those around him, and even himself. His existence has been of importance. He's been more than just a home utility. It makes us reflect on what happens after we pass on. How do you make a love story without having the characters say I love you? That was the starting point director Park Chan Wook had in mind for his new movie, Decision to Leave. His new creation withholds his more visceral trademarks of vengeance, explicit but creative violence, and sexuality. We follow a detective in the investigation of a mysterious death of a man that fell during a hike. The victim's wife becomes a suspect, but he is taken by surprise by his growing attraction towards her, and the feeling is mutual. What you get is a sprawling, convoluted romance as the investigation unfolds. It's beautiful in the hands of a filmmaker whose past cinematic experimentation has now evolved into a refined maximalism. Several creative camera movements, unexpected but inspired camera placements, hard cuts to deliver tongue-in-cheek visual punchlines. One can only assume the movie has a storyboard that could dizzy an experienced DP. There's a lot of care and detail in this, and also a lot of South Korean specificity that can at times go over my Western audience head but this simmering investigation has managed to undeniably catch something special. An always playful, but at times bittersweet love story. I feel as though you've been here before. I am Pinocchio. I'm a boy. And I think I'm... dead! I don't know if you realize that 2022 had three Pinocchio movies. Luckily, the third one was a charm. Geppetto is a man that has recently lost his son, drunk and overcome with grief. He makes a wooden puppet hoping it could be his new child. A wood sprite infuses the puppet with life, and so begins Pinocchio's journey to learn what it is to be alive and what it takes to become a real boy. First off, if we look at the technical aspects of the movie, it looks great. It's the result of a lot of hard work. It took about two and a half years to capture the stop motion. The character and creature designs are far from mundane. Some of the shots are even little winks to pass Del Toro features. Sometimes hiring renowned actors to do voice work backfires because it becomes about the names on the marquee, or the poster, and not about the actual skill. But in this case, you can feel the care in the performances, even that of the monkey. I was surprised to learn that Kate Blanchett was the one who voiced him. The visuals and the acting are backed up by a powerful story. Geppetto's backstory isn't just glossed over. We spend some time with him and his son Carlo. His character is fleshed out and is more than just a plot point. We get to experience his joy, his grief, his anger, and his confusion when dealing with a new son that he wishes was like his first. Pinocchio is an innocent child who doesn't know the ways of the world and is prone to being misled. He follows his impulses, but always has his father on his mind. He tries to be himself, but is constantly under the shadow of the one that came before him. Guillermo del Toro's Pinocchio is a family movie that, like any fable, has lessons to teach, not just to children, but to parents as well. As del Toro often says, Animation is not a genre, it's a medium, one that can give us a very magical look at life, death, grief, love, and hope. 
When you were 11, what did you think you would be doing now? Things are not what they seem, or even as what we remember them. That's the intention behind the shared retrospection of Aftersun. We start by following Sophie and Calum, a father and daughter going through the motions of a summer vacation long past, the memories of which are intercut with old video camera footage of the trip. But even more puzzling is when we cut to a strobe dance club where an older Sophie is trying to reach out to someone. At first, you're lulled by the endearing nature of the almost slice of life coming of age holiday that the pair are enjoying. But as the movie continues, you will start to realize a devastating reality hinted by several unassuming reflections. The movie is formed this way as an effort to put together the pieces of what the main character couldn't see as a child. That even if you have something in front of you that you can pause and rewind, the full picture can still escape you. A film you should be patient with to get its full haunting and well-executed purpose and it may make you reevaluate your relationship with a parent. I'm vengeance. It's pretty amazing when you realize how many setbacks this movie's production had from the start. It was going to be part of the now abandoned DCEU, then it wasn't. There were director and writer changes, and when production finally began, COVID shut everything down. The Batman is the most recent iteration of the Caped Crusader, completely disconnected from any other previous movies or DC properties. The film is set in the second year of Batman's crusade against crime in Gotham City. A murderer calling himself the Riddler has been taking out powerful yet corrupt members of Gotham's upper class. And so the Dark Knight has to use his detective skills, his connections within the GCPD, and within the city's underworld to stop the killer. Robert Pattinson's Batman feels like a vengeful spirit that stalks its prey in the darkness. In the way that even though he might not be there physically, he's in the back of criminals' minds when they look into the shadows. His fighting style is ruthless and with nothing held back, punishing his victims and earning his self-appointed moniker, Vengeance. It gives us a Batman that's a bit different than those we've seen previously on the big screen. In addition to the action involved in the brilliantly executed set pieces, this movie focuses on the investigation portion of the Batman's calling and likens it more to a neo-noir. Michael Giacchino's score and Greg Frazier's cinematography make this sprawling film a joy to watch and listen to. Watching this movie on the big screen was one of last year's more enjoyable theater experiences. Even though it clocks in at almost 3 hours runtime, I found myself rewatching it more than a handful of times since it came out. Can you relax your triangle of sadness? This like between your eyebrows here? Oh, okay. Triangle of Sadness is one of the latest Eat the Rich satires, and it wears its theme in bold flashing letters. And yet this awareness doesn't take away from enjoying the movie's absurd, almost Buñuel-esque dismantling of social classes. We follow a handful of affluent characters that never skip a day of taking themselves seriously, on a luxury yacht where every whim and discomfort is pampered away with the ship's dutiful crew. So much so, in fact, that the passengers' opulent demands are what slowly but surely lead everyone on board the ship to a disastrous and unwelcomed equalizer. It's a delightful narrative reorganization of the social hierarchy, and I liked how it takes an already absurd situation, heightens it, and then doubles down to its ultimate and decadent conclusion, an ironic exaggeration that makes it clear to the characters involved that no matter where they end up, none of them can escape the laws of the Triangle of Sadness. The Northman was one of my most anticipated movies of the year. Robert Eggers, Vikings, plus Norse mythology, there was no way I wasn't watching this film on opening weekend. The story of The Northman is a very familiar one, because it's based on a Scandinavian tale that was the basis for Shakespeare's Hamlet, and then after, The Lion King. Prince Amleth is a child that's being prepped to one day take his father's place. He bears witness to his father's murder at the hands of his uncle Fjolnir, and is forced to flee, leaving his mother to be taken. Amleth vows to avenge his father, to save his mother, and to kill Fjolnir. Years later, Amleth finds his way back to his uncle, with the objective of exacting vengeance. This film is probably the most accurate on-screen representation of Viking culture. The filmmakers work with historians to make the sets, the weapons, the hairstyles, the costumes, everything as real as possible. True to himself, Eggers places us in another time, with different customs, different beliefs, different social norms and lets us take it all in without offering any judgment. 
Alexander Skarsgård, Anya Taylor-Joy, Clay Spang, they all commit to their roles and give us great performances. With such a known story of revenge, Eggers wanted to entice viewers with familiarity while he explored the metaphysical and supernatural beliefs of the era, making them coexist with realism, giving us stunning visuals and set pieces that further steep the story in Norse mythology. This is probably Robert Eggers' most approachable film, a must-watch if you're a fan of his, or love mythology, or just want to watch Alexander Skarsgård go full beast mode. Calm. Are you coming out to the pub, Calm? How did people on a small island off the coast of Ireland deal with the internal rattling of existentialism? That might have been an initial rumination writer-director Martin McDonough thought about for the Banshees of Inishirin. One day, like many before it, Podrick goes to meet up with his best friend Calm so they can go to their favorite drinking hole and hang out. But Calm doesn't only decide to break from their routine, he suddenly puts an end to their friendship. This catches Podrick and the rest of the inhabitants of the small island by surprise. But even stranger still is what Calm is ready to do if Podrick continues to try and be his friend. He promises him that he'll grab his shears and start cutting his own fingers one by one. It's an elementary school spat taken to drastic measures. The premise by itself is an attractive entry point, but it's all sustained by McDonough's amusing and clever writing, tinted by its colloquial pitter-patter. There is also something very endearing about Colin Farrell's character, and my personal favorite of his three entries on this list. His simplicity is the perfect counterpoint to Calm's need to matter. The movie is purposely a minute story, the perfect way to tackle something as complicated as existence. The trailer for Everything Everywhere All at Once immediately caught my attention when I first watched it. It looked fun, silly, and action-packed, which wasn't what I expected from an A24 feature. At its core, the film's premise is a very simple one. A family tries to save their failing laundromat as they attempt to resolve their own interpersonal issues. Now add to that many other layers. Wayman and Evelyn are Chinese immigrants that are still getting used to navigating a culture different from the one they were born into. On top of that, their marriage is on its last legs. Evelyn's elderly father is in the picture as well, and their strained relationship is resembling that of Evelyn and her daughter Joy, who is slowly pulling away because Evelyn is still hesitant to embrace her daughter's sexual orientation. Oh, and by the way, while dealing with all of these situations, Evelyn is visited by her husband from a parallel universe, telling her that she's in danger because there's an evil entity that's hunting her across the multiverse. As the film's title suggests, there's a lot going on in this movie. It's pretty amazing how a film with such a limited budget could have VFX and action set pieces that rival what the big franchise studios churn out. With such an expansive story, the different universes, the Daniels trademark absurdist humor, the fight choreographies, both the silly ones and the more serious ones, it would have been easy to lose sight of what is important, the characters. Thankfully, among all the noise, we are given moments that delve into Evelyn's relationship with her family, how she feels about the choices she's made, what would have happened if she would have gone down another life path. Michelle Yeoh showcases her range, demonstrating that she is as adept at being vulnerable as she is at being fierce. Even though the bulk of his acting credits come from over 30 years ago, ki Hyu Kwan proves that he is not one bit rusty. Now it's time for my favorite movie of 2022. A technically efficient, well-constructed character study of a person losing her control. Tar. Lydia Tar isn't just any conductor. She's a master at the top of her game. A verbose, tack-sharp, quick-witted musical expert that appears to be as flawless as her conductions. At least, that's what we're led to believe. In her opening interview, she mentions that a conductor's responsibility is to control and shape time. But as you start to notice, the same is true with how she treats situations and people around her. What I love is how subtle this is done in the movie. You can easily miss details of where Tar is lying, being manipulative, controlling her world to reach the outcome she wants. But something has finally escaped her command, and she is unable to keep her life and even reality in line for much longer. This is such a good, tight script, unpreoccupied with what musical specificity is understood by the audience, dropping terms so nonchalantly. The same can be said with story context. It gives just enough information to understand that there's something troubling happening under the surface. Here the focus is Tar's inevitable and spectacular fall. 
played beautifully by Kate Blanchett's unforgettable, subtle but impassioned performance. Thank you for watching and see you next time.